Water is the most important natural resource needed for our existence. Traditionally, water has been used by agriculture for the production of food and fiber, by municipal users for drinking, cooking, and washing, by industry for producing and processing goods, and by recreational users enjoying the environment. As our population increases, the demand for water for each of these uses is also increasing. There has been a special emphasis in recent years on protecting the environment and the many species that live in that environment, each of which depend on water. As water demand increases, there is a need to better manage water resources to make the best use of the limited supply. Better management requires a sound understanding of water use, which begins with accurate water measurement. Regardless of how water is used, the public wants assurance that water is being used in a beneficial and efficient manner. With proper water measurement, individual irrigators and agriculture as a whole can show that water is being used efficiently to produce food and fiber for a growing population. Accurate flow measurement is critical for proper water management, particularly at the individual farm level. When a producer knows the amount of water needed by a crop and has the ability to measure and apply the correct amount of water at the correct time, water is used most efficiently and optimum crop production can be achieved. In addition, by not applying more water than the soil can hold, leaching of water and chemicals below the root zone and into the groundwater can be controlled. Water measurement can reduce disputes among water users by promoting defined and equitable methods for allocating available water supplies. This is important whether the source is groundwater or surface water. An irrigator wants to know that they are getting the same amount of water as their neighbor. The question of being equitable is only amplified when water restrictions due to declining water tables or inadequate snowpack limit the amount of water available for irrigation. Although not popular, most often the purpose of the restriction is to protect a finite groundwater supply or stretch a limited current year surface water supply. In addition to the quantity issue, many areas use water restrictions to protect water quality. Again, by preventing over-irrigation, leaching can be controlled. Keep in mind, when the water supply is limited, water measurement becomes even more important. Measuring water delivered from wells and pumps is necessary to evaluate the overall performance of an irrigation system. Poor well and pump performance can lead to wasted water and higher pumping costs, while adding no benefits to crop production. In fact, it has been shown in many cases that too much water can reduce crop yields and crop quality. If agriculture cannot define where and how water is being used in their industry, it will become more difficult to compete with other users that do measure their water use. Water measurement improves an individual irrigator's water management capability and helps to define the amount of water needed for crop production. We measure many agricultural inputs, for example, we plant a specific number of seeds per acre. We apply chemicals based on the pests we have and what the label says. And soil samples are taken and then used to calculate the kind and amount of fertilizer needed. Why not measure water? It's the most important natural resource we have for crop production. Water can be delivered to fields in open channels or through pipes. This video explains how to measure the flow of water in pipelines that flow full. The method described in this tape do not apply to open canals or ditches or to pipes that flow only partially full. The flow of water is expressed as a volume passing a fixed location in a given amount of time. In a simple example, the volume of water leaving the hose and entering the bucket is 5 gallons in 30 seconds or 10 gallons per minute. Water flow rates are expressed in a manner similar to the way one might state the capacity of a grain auger. Common units of measure for grain flow through an auger might be bushels per hour, whereas common units of water flow measurement are gallons per minute. In both cases, we express flow rate as a volume per unit time. The flow rate of water is also commonly called the discharge. Another common unit for expressing water flow rates is cubic feet per second, or CFS, sometimes called second foot. A cubic foot is the volume of a cube that is one foot wide by one foot tall by one foot deep, or about seven and a half gallons. A flow rate of one cubic foot per second is equal to about 450 gallons per minute. 
In addition to knowing the flow rate at a given moment, one often needs to know the total volume of water delivered over an extended length of time, perhaps for billing purposes or to document a single irrigation event or seasonal water use. The total volume of flow can be computed by multiplying the flow rate by the amount of elapsed time. In our example, if we ran water from the hose for 10 minutes, we would deliver 100 gallons of water, or 10 gallons per minute, multiplied by 10 minutes. Most flow meters today have the capability to perform these calculations automatically and display both an instantaneous flow rate and an accumulated volume. A common unit of measure for water volumes is the acre foot, which is the volume of water needed to cover a one-acre area to a depth of one foot. An acre foot is equal to 43,560 cubic feet. To determine the volume of water delivered in acre feet, multiply the flow rate in CFS by the elapsed time in seconds, then divide by 43,560. A flow rate of one CFS for a duration of one day will deliver a volume of about two acre feet. Using a stopwatch and a bucket to measure water flow is a direct method, but is often impractical when the flow rate is large or when the water cannot be easily diverted into a bucket or other container of known volume. As a result, water flow in pipelines is usually measured indirectly, using sensors that measure physical properties of the flow, such as its velocity, and then relate these to the flow rate using tables, charts, or equations. Two principal approaches are common when measuring flow rates through full pipes. The first is to measure the velocity of the flow in the pipe and then calculate the flow rate using the equation Q equals V times A. Where Q is the flow rate or discharge, V is the average velocity or speed of the water moving through the pipe, and A is the cross-sectional area of the pipe. This equation is called the continuity equation. If the velocity and area are expressed in feet per second and square feet, then the computed flow rate will be in cubic feet per second. Many different methods are available for measuring the velocity, and flow meters are often named according to the method used. A complication of using methods based on measurement of the velocity is the need to measure the average velocity. As shown here, the velocity of the water flowing in a pipe varies across the width of the pipe. The velocity is generally highest at the center line of the pipe and lowest at the edge of the pipe due to friction between the flowing water and the pipe wall. This is true even in very smooth pipes. Fortunately, the shape of the velocity profile tends to be very consistent in straight pipes. As a result, velocity-based meters can measure the velocity at the center line of the pipe or at a specific distance from the pipe wall and then relate this measurement to the average velocity. Sometimes the velocity profile in a pipe is skewed by the presence of gates, valves, or elbows, which cause the flow to concentrate on one side of the pipe. When this happens, the relationship between the measured velocity and the average velocity changes, making flow measurements inaccurate. For this reason, most flow meters should be installed in a straight reach of pipe whenever possible. The recommended length of straight pipe upstream and downstream from a meter is usually specified by the meter manufacturer as a multiple of the pipe diameter. It is important to follow the manufacturer's installation recommendations for proper operation. The second common approach to pipe flow measurement is to determine the amount of energy or pressure needed to drive flowing water through an opening of known dimensions. The pressure is often expressed as the head or the vertical height of water in a tube connected to the pressurized pipe. An equation is used to compute the flow rate as a function of the difference in head between two points on the device, usually one on the upstream side and one downstream. The equation relating to the head difference and the flow rate is based on the physics of the device and the flow through it. This equation usually includes calibration factors developed through laboratory testing. Flow meters based on this principle are usually named after the device across which the head difference is measured, such as an orifice plate flow meter or a Venturi meter. Although these energy-based devices do not measure the velocity of flow in the pipe, the velocity profiles we showed earlier are still an important consideration. The laboratory testing used to develop the calibration factors for these devices is based on the assumption of a well-developed symmetric velocity profile approaching the device. This flow condition is again ensured by locating the device in a length of straight pipe, well downstream and upstream from flow disturbances caused by valves, elbows, or changes in pipe size. If the velocity profile is skewed, the calibration factors will be incorrect 
and the measured flow rate will be an error. We will now discuss several specific types of flow meters encountered in agricultural piping systems. We will explain briefly how they work and describe some advantages and disadvantages and typical applications. Propeller meters are a common velocity-based method of measuring flow. The propeller rotates on an axis aligned with the pipe axis, and the rotational speed of the propeller is proportional to the flow velocity. To get an accurate measurement of the true average velocity in the pipe, the meter must be located at the center line of the pipe, and the propeller diameter should be 50 to 75 percent of the pipe diameter. Propeller meters can be installed at the downstream end of a pipe where it discharges into an open channel if the pipe is flowing full at the outlet. Propeller meters can also be installed at inline locations. Propeller meters are susceptible to errors caused by clogging with debris and sediment working its way into bearings. A paddle wheel meter is similar in concept to the propeller meter except that the axis of rotation is perpendicular to the flow direction. Paddle wheels sense the velocity at a specified distance from the wall of the pipe. From this measurement, they estimate the average velocity and thus the flow rate using a calibration equation. Paddle wheel meters must be inserted into the pipe an exact distance specified by the manufacturer so that their calibration is accurate. Paddle wheel meters can be made portable using the pipe saddle installation kit shown here. Vortex shedding flow meters are based on the fact that in a certain range of velocities, an obstruction placed in the flow will cause alternating vortices to be shed from the edges of the obstruction. The frequency at which the vortices are shed varies with the flow velocity. This phenomena explains the ripples observed in a flag on a windy day. Vortices are shed in an alternating pattern from the edges of the flagpole. In a vortex shedding flow meter, a sensor downstream from a specially shaped obstruction measures the frequency of the vortices. This allows the flow velocity to be determined and a flow rate calculated. The obstruction is usually located off the center line of the pipe, a specified distance from the pipe wall. Manufacturer's specifications tell how far to insert the meter for use in pipes of different sizes. Vortex shedding flow meters are economical and cause only a slight disturbance of the flow. A variety of flow meters are based upon the device known as a pitot tube. A pitot tube is a small open tube pointed directly into the flow. The height to which water rises in the tube indicates the velocity. Alternately, the pressure in the tube can be sensed and will also increase in proportion to the velocity. Commercially packaged meters based on the pitot tube concept are available, such as the Collins meter, often used for flow measurement during pump and well tests. Acoustic velocity meters are generally non-invasive, presenting no obstruction to the flow. The sensing element is a set of one or more transducers that send sound waves through the flowing water. On large pipes, the transducers may be permanently installed in the walls of the pipe, while on smaller pipes, the transducers may be clamped onto the exterior of the pipe. Such systems are generally portable and capable of measuring flows in pipes of varying sizes. Acoustic flow meters can be based on two different acoustic principles. Transit time meters, sometimes called ultrasonic flow meters, send sound waves back and forth between two transducers, in an upstream direction and then in a downstream direction. The difference in travel times provides an indication of the flow velocity along the acoustic path between the transducers. This velocity can then be used to compute the flow rate. Doppler-based acoustic meters take advantage of a physical phenomenon called the Doppler shift. When a sound source is moving toward a listener, the pitch will be higher than when the sound source moves away from the listener. This can be observed in the sound of a passing train. Similarly, sound waves reflected from a moving object undergo a Doppler shift whose magnitude is proportional to the velocity of the object. Doppler-based flow meters send out sound waves that bounce off of minute particles in the flow. The meter listens for these reflected sound waves and uses the Doppler shift to compute a velocity and flow rate. Acoustic meters do not disrupt the flow and are able to measure reversals of flow. Prices have come down in recent years, but acoustic meters may not be economical for most on-farm applications. They are probably best considered for measurement of larger flows near pumping facilities. Orifice meters are one of the common pressure-based flow measurement devices. Head differential from the upstream side to the downstream side of a constricted orifice plate installed in the pipe is related to the flow rate through a calibration equation. In low pressure systems, the head difference can be observed visually as the difference in the elevation of two water columns. 
In most practical applications, the head difference is more conveniently measured by two pressure gauges, a differential pressure transducer or a U-tube manometer. The pressure transducer allows the flow measurement to be stored in an electronic data recorder. Orifice meters cause relatively large energy losses and are limited to a small range of discharges, a ratio of about 1 to 3 for a single orifice size. Venturi meters operate on principles similar to orifice plates, but with a highly streamlined entrance and exit section around the constricted throat. Pressure is sensed at the throat and at a point upstream from the converging section. Venturi meters are highly accurate, but also relatively expensive. In recent years, low-cost but very effective Venturi meters have been constructed from standard precast concrete or plastic pipe sections and fittings. Elbow meters are a slightly different type of pressure-based measurement device. As water passes through an elbow, a low-pressure zone is created on the inside of the bend, and a high-pressure zone is established on the outside of the bend. The pressure difference between these two points is related to the velocity of flow through the elbow and can thus be related to the discharge. The exact calibration between pressure difference and flow rate varies depending on the construction details of the elbow. Many standard sizes and types of elbows have been calibrated and research is ongoing to develop calibrations for new varieties. Although it would be unusual to install an elbow specifically for flow measurement, existing elbows and agricultural pipe systems can offer inexpensive opportunities for reasonably accurate flow measurement. In addition to the velocity and pressure-based meters we have shown, there are devices available that exploit other properties of flowing water to make discharge measurements. In an electromagnetic flow meter, a magnetic field is established through a special pipe section constructed from a non-magnetic, non-conductive material. Water, which is a conductor of electricity, passes through the magnetic field and creates a voltage difference between electrodes located on opposite sides of the special pipe section. The discharge through the meter can be calculated from the measured voltage. Electromagnetic meters are non-invasive but relatively expensive compared to other pipe flow meters. These meters also have the ability to measure reverse flow. With the information we have presented here, you should be able to select a type of meter that will meet your needs. Proper installation is needed to obtain accurate measurements and provide reliable long-term operation of a measurement device. There are two issues of concern during installation. First, the device must be installed at a location where the flow conditions are suitable for measurement. And second, the device must be properly installed so that it accurately measures the intended flow properties, such as velocity or pressure, that are used to determine the flow rate. First, the pipe must be flowing full. If the pipe is not full, at the very least the device will overestimate the flow area and the flow rate. At worst, the device will not work at all. An Eisenhower hump is a device that is sometimes used to force a pipe to flow full at a measurement location. Second, the flow approaching the device must be uniform, meaning not skewed toward one side of the pipe or the other. Since we cannot see inside of the pipe, we ensure good approach flow by requiring the device to be located in a straight section of pipe, well downstream and upstream from valves, elbows, and other devices that might disrupt the flow. Requirements for the length of straight pipe vary depending on the measurement device and the type of flow disruption. Meter manufacturers often provide recommendations. In general, at least 10 diameters of straight pipe are needed upstream from the device and 2 to 5 diameters of straight pipe downstream from the device. In some cases, much more length of straight pipe is needed. For example, at least 30 diameters of straight pipe should be provided if a meter will be installed downstream from a partially opened gate or valve. If the required length of straight pipe cannot be provided, straightening vanes may be used to make the flow more uniform at the measurement location. However, straightening vanes add cost and increase maintenance and should be used only at sites where there is little debris in the water. For straightening vanes to be effective, they should have a length of at least two times the pipe diameter. Accuracy and dependability of flow measurement can be improved by proper orientation of a device during installation. Because air bubbles will collect near the top of a pipe and sediment will collect near the bottom, it is usually best to install measurement devices so that sensing elements, such as pressure taps, 
velocity sensors and acoustic transducers are on the sides of the pipe, or at least not at the exact top and bottom. When a measurement device must be installed downstream from elbows, valves, or other devices that disrupt the flow, better measurement accuracy is usually obtained by orienting the device so that sensors are 90 degrees out of the plane of the elbow or the plane of the valve motion. For example, if a valve moves vertically to open and close, the sensor should be placed on the sides of the pipe. Pipe flow measurement devices should always be installed at a location where the pipe diameter is constant and known. Devices should not be installed where the pipe diameter is increasing or decreasing, as often occurs very close to pumps and valves. The most important dimension that must be known for most pipe flow measurement devices is the inside diameter of the pipe, since this defines the cross-sectional area of the pipe. If the pipe cannot be opened up to allow direct measurement of the inside diameter, it may be necessary to also know the pipe wall thickness so that the inside diameter can be computed from the measured outside diameter. The outside diameter of a pipe can be measured with a set of calipers or a circumference tape, which is wrapped around the pipe and shows the outside diameter directly. With a regular tape measure, the outside diameter can be determined by measuring the circumference and dividing by 3.142, the value of pi. Pipe wall thickness must be accurately known when using an acoustic travel time flow meter. An ultrasonic pipe wall sensor is useful for those who often work with these meters. The thickness of any pipe wall lining, such as a layer of coal tar epoxy, must also be known and programmed into the flow computer. Another important aspect of installation is properly locating sensors on or within the pipe. Ultrasonic travel time flow meters must have the acoustic transducers precisely located so that the measured acoustic travel time between them can be used to accurately compute the velocity and flow rate. The transducers for permanent ultrasonic flow meter installations in large pipes are located using sophisticated surveying techniques. Portable meters use calibrated tracks that ensure proper location and alignment of the transducers. Transducers must have good acoustic contact with the pipe wall. If a strong acoustic signal is not received by the meter, it may be necessary to sand the pipe to remove surface roughness or paint coatings. An acoustic gel is also applied to the pipe wall surface to improve the transmission of the acoustic signal into the pipe. This gel may have to be cleaned up and replaced on a regular interval if the meter is left in place for an extended period of time. Sensors placed inside of a pipe must also be properly located. Propeller meters require that the propeller be located exactly on the pipe's center line. If they are off-center, they will usually under-report the flow rate. Propeller diameter should be about one-half the inside diameter of the pipe so that the meter provides a good indication of the average velocity, not the maximum velocity that occurs at the center line of the pipe. Vortex shedding flow meters and paddle wheel type meters shown earlier are intended to be located off-center, but at precisely specified positions. They measure the velocity at a specific position within the velocity profile, and an algorithm within the meter then converts this into a flow rate. If the sensor is located at a position other than the one assumed by the meter's algorithm, the calculated flow rate will be in error. Many closed conduit flow meters, such as nozzles, orifice plates, elbow meters, and venturi meters, rely on measurements made at pressure taps located at specific positions upstream or downstream from the meter, or integrated into the device itself. The differential pressure between these locations is used to compute the flow rate, usually based on calibration tests carried out in a hydraulic laboratory. The pressure taps must be located in the same positions as those used to develop the calibration. On the inside of the device, the pressure tap should be smooth and flush with the inner flow surfaces so that the pressure is measured accurately. Periodic calibration and verification of measurements is important for establishing and maintaining confidence in the results of a measurement program. Since the actual flow conditions are not visible in most pipe flow applications, problems can go unnoticed. One method for verification is to temporarily install another device, such as a portable acoustic flow meter, and compare the results. Exact agreement should not be expected because both the device being tested and the comparison device are subject to random errors that cannot be eliminated. Another useful verification test is to reduce the flow to zero and check the output of the meter. This is often used to verify the proper operation of acoustic transit time meters. When performing a zero flow check, be very careful to close the valve slowly to avoid water hammer damage to the pipeline. 
The safe closing time increases in proportion to the length of the pipeline. If you're unsure of the safe closing time, consult your local NRCS office for engineering assistance. Reducing the flow to zero for a short time while a pump is running will not damage the pump. Continuity checks are another valuable verification tool. In a closed pipe system, the sum of the flows into a junction and the sum of the flows out of a junction should be equal. If flows in all branches entering and exiting a junction are measured, then a continuity check can be performed as often as desired. Another form of continuity check was demonstrated earlier when we diverted the flow into a container of known volume. Knowing the volume of the container and the time required to fill it, the flow rate can be computed from the equation Q equals volume divided by time. This is a very satisfying method of verification when it can be conveniently applied, since one can actually see the water in hand. Preventative maintenance is essential for proper operation of flow measurement devices. Inspection and servicing on a routine basis can greatly extend life expectancy and maintain accuracy. For best results, follow the manufacturer's recommended maintenance program. Each meter or device may have maintenance needs specific to that particular make or model. Maintenance of flow measurement equipment can be divided into two categories, ongoing seasonal operation and off-season maintenance. During the operating season, check periodically for physical damage at the meter head. Next, look for erratic movements of the flow rate indicator or a flow rate that is different from what you might expect. This may indicate plugging or mechanical problems of an existing installation or an improperly installed meter. For installations using surface water, meters may become plugged or covered with debris, moss, or other material, causing inaccurate readings or no reading at all. An access port upstream or downstream of the meter is a quick and effective method to check for and remove any obstructions. When constructing access ports, make sure that no intrusion is made into the pipe that may change the flow path of the water and cause inaccurate readings. For vortex meters, an occasional visual inspection may be required to determine if sediment or other debris is attached to the shedder or shroud meter. Care should be taken in removing this material to avoid damaging or scratching the shedder or sensor device. During the off-season, follow the yearly maintenance requirement as suggested by the manufacturer. This could include removal and storage in winter months to protect against the weather and vandalism. Look for signs of moisture or fogging on the inside of the lens of the flow rate indicator. If this particular indicator was meant to be watertight or sealed, Repair at the present time might avoid the need for more expensive repairs or replacement in the future. For propeller type meters, wobbling of the meter could indicate bearing problems or an unbalanced propeller. Sudden jerks may indicate register gears are not meshing properly. For mechanical meters, check meter bearings or bushings for freedom of movement and shaft side play. If shafts do not spin freely or if there is excessive side play, service may be required. Some meters require yearly service and greasing of these moving parts. Make sure to use the correct lubricant as suggested by the manufacturer. For pressure monitored devices, debris, sediment, or other material may block pressure taps. Air may also accumulate and become trapped within the pressure tubing. Both cases lead to inaccurate flow measurements. A back flush with water or air may occasionally be required to remove the trapped air or unwanted material. Metal components such as orifice plates and venturi tubes may require inspection every few years. If corroded, the metal may require repair or repainting. Yearly calibration or verification may or may not be suggested by the manufacturer. For meters not requiring recalibration, field verification with a known accurate meter every few years will provide a good check that the meter is operating properly. With a good installation and regular preventative maintenance, a high-quality flow meter should provide many years of accurate measurements and trouble-free operation. One of the most important and often overlooked reasons for measuring water is to improve on-farm irrigation water management. This section of the videotape shows several ways to use water measurement data. With these methods, you can increase your overall irrigation efficiency, reduce runoff, decrease the likelihood of leaching chemicals below the root zone, and reduce pumping and operational costs. Earlier in this videotape, 
we define flow rate as the volume delivered per unit time. For flow through pipelines, flow rate is often expressed in gallons per minute, or GPM. In contrast, flow rates in open channels are often expressed in cubic feet per second, or CFS. To compute the volume of water delivered over an extended period, we multiply the flow rate, Q, by the elapsed time, T. If the flow rate is 10 gallons per minute and the elapsed time is 10 minutes, then the volume is 100 gallons. Water volumes can also be expressed in terms of the area that a given volume of water covers, A, and the depth of coverage, D. The volume is the product of the area and the depth. Equating the volume delivered to the volume applied, we obtain a useful equation relating the flow rate, the time of application, the size of the field, and the depth of application. The product of the flow rate, Q, and the elapsed time, T, is equal to the product of the irrigated area, A, and the depth of application, D. If any three of these quantities is known, the fourth can be computed. Before we illustrate the use of the equation, we need to talk a little more about units. For convenience, we often express the field size in acres, the depth of application in inches, and the time of application in hours. The units of our equation will be consistent if we then express the flow rate in units of acre inches per hour. This is still a volume per unit time, with the unit of volume being the acre inch. The acre inch is the volume of water needed to cover a one acre field to a depth of one inch. Similarly, the volume of water that covers a one-acre field to a depth of one foot is called the acre foot. There are several convenient relationships between the different units used to express volume and flow rate. Some of the more important conversions are shown here. The calculations we will illustrate are not difficult, but some conversion between the different units for flow rate and volume is often required. When performing the calculations, it is helpful to write down the units and carry them along as a part of the calculation. When we finish with the calculation, the units on each side of the equation should be the same. When it becomes necessary to convert from one set of units to another, we can do so by using one of the conversion factors. A short example will illustrate these concepts. To determine the volume of water supplied by an irrigation system, we multiply the flow rate by the length of time for which that flow rate occurred. This is the left-hand side of our equation, Q times T. For example, a 900 GPM well is pumping water for 8 hours. How many gallons of water is pumped? First, we convert gallons per minute to gallons per hour by multiplying by a conversion factor. 60 minutes per hour to obtain 54,000 gallons per hour. Next, we multiply 54,000 gallons per hour by our 8-hour pumping time to obtain 432,000 gallons. Similarly, we can compute the volume in acre inches. First, we convert the flow rate from GPM to acre inches per hour by recalling that 450 gallons per minute is 1 acre inch per hour. Thus, our flow rate of 900 GPM is equal to 2 acre inches per hour. Multiplying 2 acre inches per hour by 8 hours shows that the volume of water delivered is 16 acre inches. We will now illustrate some irrigation management uses of the equation Q times T equals A times D. The equation can be rearranged to solve for any one of the variables. If any three of the variables are known, the fourth may be calculated. For example, if you know the flow rate, the time of application, and the irrigated area, you can determine the average depth of water applied. Knowing the depth of application will help you determine when the next irrigation is needed. Similarly, if you know the irrigated area, the desired depth of application, and the flow rate, you can compute the required irrigation time. If we are using a center pivot sprinkler, this calculation could be used to determine the desired rotation interval for the pivot. The same approach can be used to determine either of the other two variables, flow rate or irrigated area. Solving for these quantities might be useful when designing a new irrigation system. For example, we might want to determine the pump size needed to irrigate a given area, or we might need to determine the size of field that can be irrigated with a well operating at a given flow rate. 
Now let's consider some examples of using water measurement data to manage sprinkler and furrow irrigation systems. This center pivot sprinkler irrigates 128 acres and is supplied by a well. The meter shows that the flow rate is 750 gallons per minute. If you wish to apply a depth of one inch of water to the field, what should be the time for one revolution of the sprinkler? We begin by converting the flow rate to acre inches per hour. The field area is already expressed in acres, so we can compute the required time of application without the need for further conversions. The sprinkler should be set to make one revolution in about 77 hours to apply a gross depth of one inch of water to the field. In some cases, your flow meter may have a totalizing capability and will show the total volume of water pumped in either acre inches, acre feet, or gallons. Let's compute the gross depth of application when the flow meter determines the volume of water delivered. Assume that a furrow irrigated field covers 38 acres. Your totalizing flow meter reads 4.243 acre feet at the start of the irrigation and at the end it reads 10.213 acre feet. In this case, we do not need to know Q or T individually because we can directly calculate the total volume of water applied, 5.97 acre feet. We convert this volume to acre inches and then divide by the field area to determine that the gross depth of application is 1.89 inches. These examples have shown how flow measurement equipment and the data it provides can improve your ability to understand and manage your irrigation activities. In real world situations, there may be additional factors to consider. For example, the total amount of water applied is not usually available to the crop due to evaporation, runoff, and deep percolation. Concepts such as application efficiency and net irrigation depth can be used to account for these factors. You can learn about these concepts through additional videotapes and educational materials available from your local Extension or NRCS office. This tape has explained the needs for water measurement, the methods used to measure water flow in pipelines, installation and maintenance procedures, and how to use flow measurement data to improve your water management. This knowledge will help you conserve a valuable natural resource and improve your bottom line. If you have any questions related to flow measurement or the use of these measurements for irrigation water management, contact your local office of the Natural Resources Conservation Service the Bureau of Reclamation, or the Cooperative Extension Service.